chapter 4 especially, which is Jonah's response to his successful mission in Nineveh. And it's not what you'd expect. So let's take a look at it. Jonah chapter 3, verse 10 is where I'm going to start, because I want you to see what God did first. When God saw their actions, that they had repented and turned to him, they turned from their evil way of living. God relented concerning the judgment he had threatened them, and he did not destroy them. You look at that last week. So what's his reaction? This displeased Jonah terribly, and he became very angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh Lord, this is just what I thought would happen when I was in my own country. This is what I tried to prevent by attempting to escape to Tarshish. Because I knew, I knew that you were a gracious and a compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in mercy. And one who relents concerning threatened judgment. So now, Lord, kill me instead. Because I would rather die than live. And the Lord said, Are you really so very angry? Jonah left the city, and he sat down east of the city. And he made a shelter for himself there. And he sat down under it in the shade to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God appointed a little plant. And he caused it to grow up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to rescue him from his misery. Now Jonah was very delighted about the little plant. So God sent a worm at dawn the next day, and it attacked the little plant so that it dried up. And when the sun began to shine, God sent a hot east wind. So the sun beat down on Jonah's head, and he grew faint. So he despaired of life and said, I would rather die than live. God said to Jonah, are you really so very angry about the little plant? And he said, I'm as angry as I could possibly be. And the Lord said, you are upset about this little plant, something for which you have not worked, nor did you do anything to make it grow. It grew up overnight, and it died the next day. Should I not be more concerned about Nineveh? <clears throat> this enormous city. There are more than 120,000 people in it who don't know the right from wrong, as well as many animals. And that's the end of the book. Mm -hmm. An unusual way to end, mm -hmm. kind of abrupt. And there might be a reason for that. We'll get to that next week. <laughs> Jonah. Here he is with his unpredictable plant. So what do you really care about? What are you really passionate about? What brings out your deepest feelings and your deepest emotions? What makes you pound the table? Or what brings a tear to your eye? Our deep emotions betray our true motivations, our true values. They reveal to us what really matters to us. I was thinking about um, a particular commercial. It came to mind out of the blue this week as I was thinking about this passage and God's pity upon them, which really means his tears that he has for Nineveh. And I was thinking of this little commercial that I saw when I was a little kid. It's always kind of stuck with me. And maybe you've seen it too. I think I've got it up here. Let's see if you remember this. It used to look a lot better. <laughs>
some people have a deep abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. There's something that's always stuck in my mind about that commercial. And I'm not here to talk about environmental issues today. But, but now it makes the point, doesn't it? A powerful point. The little tear in the eyes of the Native American guy when he sees how this beautiful country has been so polluted and not well taken care of. It's a powerful little commercial. The tear in the eye. Interestingly, the, the backstory of the commercial is that the guy who plays a Native American was actually had Italian immigrant parents. Um, but he always identified with Native Americans, and he played Native Americans in numerous movies back in his day. And he actually pretended to be and claimed to be, I think, uh, I don't remember if it was Chippewa, well, not Chippewa, it was uh, one of the Navajo or something. In any case, he claimed to be Native American, but he really wasn't. But he was an expert in it because he studied up on it and he knew a lot about it. And interestingly, he objected to the idea of having a tear in his eyes because he said Native Americans, they don't cry. They don't cry. But then he was, con they talked him into it. He said, well, then how much more powerful would it be to have a tear in his eye? What's important to God? What brings a tear, metaphorically? to his eye. And what is it that motivates each and every one of us? What is it that causes our emotions to rise up within us? There's an interesting contrast in this particular passage between what Jonah was feeling and what God was feeling. Jonah's feelings were expressed in anger. God's feelings were expressed in compassion, mercy, love, and pity for this nation, or this city called Nineveh. So we're going to talk about that a little bit today. And the first question is, why was Jonah angry? Why was Jonah angry here anyway? I mean, it's kind of a surprising reaction. I think the first time you hear this story, you're kind of surprised. I mean, he had been, he had, I mean, he had been going the other direction, and God had used a series of events to finally get him back to his mission. And we know all about that. We've been through that a few times. And God worked in some pretty extraordinary ways to get him back on track. But every time he got a chance, he went the other direction. He didn't do what God had told him to do. He was the prodigal missionary, as we've seen, over and over and over again, trying to do his own thing instead of doing what God had called him to do. Well, finally, after a storm, and after nearly drowning, and after being delivered by a big fish, and the big fish vomiting him onto the, onto the shore, and then he comes and stands before Nineveh. Clearly, you know, I'm sure it must have been an interesting thing to see a man who'd been inside of a big fish for three days. Um, maybe a little seaweed around his neck. He comes up, repent, turn, because in 40 days you're going to be toast. And then, I'm paraphrasing, but that's basically his message. Now, so, Jonah is hoping that his message is going to come true. He wants Nineveh to be destroyed. He wants that to happen. He's hoping that God will follow through on the threat that he's made, that this is a wicked, vile, evil city, and their days are numbered, and so just watch out, because in 40 days, you're not going to be here anymore. This is what Jonah had hoped in. This is what he was looking for. And then God does this surprising thing. He shows compassion. He shows mercy. Instead of giving that punishment that he said he was going to, he changes his mind, that's the language of the, of the scripture here, and he turns toward them because they have turned toward him. It's a fascinating thing. So Jonah's reaction, he was angry. He was as angry as you can get. In fact, he kind of has a death wish. Here. He's like, I would rather die. Um, that's some serious anger. His feelings have certainly come to the surface, haven't they? So we need to ask ourselves, why this reaction? Why would some
someone have this reaction? And then we need to ask ourselves some questions about our own reactions. Why the theological reason that he was so angry was that he he valued justice more than he valued grace. He valued justice more than he valued grace. And that's very different than the way our God is. He becomes a self-appointed judge that thinks he knows better than God what should be done. Now this is an age-old problem that goes way back to the Garden of Eden that's plagued us ever since, where we think we know better than God knows. We always have a better idea than God. And so we try to assert our idea or try to convince him that maybe our idea is a better idea, and it never seems to work out very well, does it? But he values justice more than grace. He thinks this is an evil people, and they were. The Ninevites and the Assyrian Empire of that day were one of the most ruthless, evil groups of people that were on the face of the earth. Eventually, they're going to come and wipe off the face of the map, the northern kingdom of Israel. I mean, this, these are enemies, and they are wicked people. The just thing would have been for God to wipe them off the face of the earth. And Jonah's saying, go God, go do it. I want to see it. That's the day I'm living for. And then when God does the opposite, it shows grace and mercy and compassion. He says, oh, that's not what I wanted. In fact, that makes me downright angry. I love verse 2. He says to the Lord, Oh Lord, this is just what I thought would happen. And didn't I tell you this is really going to happen? That's why I ran from you in the first place. That's why I wanted to go to Tarsus when you told me to go to Nineveh. The reason I was resisting you this whole time is I have a better idea because I know who you are. I know what kind of God you are. You're that gracious and merciful kind of God. You're that compassionate kind of God. You're a God who loves. A God who is slow to get angry. Abounding in loving kindness. And that's that beautiful word hesed in the Hebrew, which is love and kindness and mercy and God's steadfast love, it's sometimes translated. It's his relentless love that refuses to give up on his people. It is that God who continues to love us even when we're faithless and we go the other direction. It's the kind of love that God showed Jonah. It's the kind of love that God keeps showing Israel every time it goes its own way and does its own thing. And here it's expressed in an unexpected way. With someone that God has no covenant with, but that were repentant, the Ninevites. And God showed Hesed to them as well. He's the one who changes his mind concerning the threatened judgment. He's the one who decided that because you've turned to me, I'm going to turn toward you, and I'm going to forgive your sins. I'm going to bring a, a revival to this city of Nineveh. An unexpected event. So, he said, that's what, I told you, that's the kind of God you are. That's why I ran away. That's why I did what I did. So now, Lord, kill me instead. Because I would rather die than live. And the Lord's reaction to that is, are you really that angry? Why are you so angry about this? Why are you so angry? Why is Jonah angry? Um, one commentator writes, Jonah is a stubborn man. He's sure that he's right. That Yahweh is wrong. That God is wrong. Nineveh should have been destroyed for its wickedness. That would have been the just course of action on God's part. Through clenched teeth, Jonah has told God that in, that in so many words in his angry prayer in chapter 4, verses 2 to 3. See, Jonah um, values justice over grace, and a lot of us do. We're kind of like the... Who was it? The, I think Feinberg says that the elder, he's kind of like the elder brother in the prodigal son story. Remember the prodigal son story? The prodigal son asks for his inheritance. He goes, he squanders the money. He lives in riotous living, it says. Eventually, he ends up in a pig pen feeding <laughs> pigs, which is not a great place for Jews. And he says, I, I think I'd be better off as a slave in my father's household, so I'm going home. He comes home. The father celebrates his coming back. The other brother, however, doesn't like seeing grace extended to the brother. He's upset. He's upset that his dad has brought his this disobedient brother. He brought that guy back home, and not only did he let him come back home and treat him like a son, 
and forgive him, he said, we're going to have a celebration. We're going to bring out the fatted cow. We're going to bring out. The, we're going to put on the biggest celebration that you can imagine because you just, my my son who was lost has come home, and he's just stewing in his anger. Now, in reality, that's probably the main point of the parable, because if you read it in its context, he's confronting the attitude of the Pharisees and how they were resisting the fact that Jesus was a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And why would you extend grace to people like that? How about us religious people? Us Pharisees? You know, we're scrupulous. We even count, count the mint and the cumin and the, the spices to make sure we're making our tithes just exactly right. And, and you, you waste your time with this riffraff? What kind of a God are you? So many of us prefer justice over grace, don't we? We think, oh, God, that's a wicked person. That person, you should just wipe them off the face of the earth. And, and especially this is true when you think about it. I mean, Nineveh is not just some nation out there or some city out there. This is their arch enemy. It's one of the arch enemies that they're facing. It's given them a lot of trouble already, and they're going to give them more trouble. So often when we go to war with a nation, what do we do? We objectify the enemy. We... We try to pretend that they're less human than we, that somehow we're in the right and they're in the wrong, and, and our own prejudice begins to set in, and it's not the way it ought to be, but it, it is the way it is, and Jonah here has that going on, without a doubt. He says, God, you're always gracious and merciful. You're always compassionate. And these, these two adjectives which describe God both appear 13 times in the Old Testament together. They, they keep, this is one of the most common expressions in the Old Testament of who God is. And so many people tell me, well, that God of the Old Testament, I don't know. But who is God in the Old Testament? He's the gracious and merciful, compassionate God. It's when, when Moses says, I want to see your glory, what does God say? I am the gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love. And, you know, and what does Jonah say? That's the kind of God you are. That's why I ran the other direction, because I know you're gracious and compassionate. You're going to give up. You're not, you're not going to follow through on your judgment on these people. So, pretty poor missionary. But at least we can relate to him. Um, and what was going on with Jonah, I think what God is doing in this story is he's pointing fun not only at Jonah, but at Israel generally. Because they had come to an understanding of God that they had a unique relationship with God, which they did, but that God cared only about Israel. That God only cared about them. That they were the exceptional ones and God only loved them. And He didn't care about their enemies. He didn't care about Nineveh. He didn't care about Babylon. He didn't care about Egypt. He didn't care about the Phoenician. He didn't care about any of these other groups of people. But He, and we know, I mean, they even had theology for it. I mean, they had Bible verses they could turn to. God made a covenant with Abraham, and Abraham said this, and God said this, and, and then, of course, he had Moses, and God gave him the law, and there was a renewed covenant there. And then when David comes onto the scene, you know, God showed favor again. And there are these verses that talk about the unique nature of Israel, so there's no doubt that God did choose them as a holy nation, as a people dearly loved by God. That's a part of who they are. But it didn't mean that they were supposed to hold on to it themselves. Part of the covenant with Abraham was they were supposed to be a blessing to the nations. And they forgot about that part. They forgot all about that part. Jonah forgot about that part. And so did, so did the nation of Israel generally forget. They began to think, oh, it's about us. It's about us. Putting us first. That's what's most important. It's not about anybody else. And God says, no, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Under the surface, what was brewing? Prejudice. That's not uncommon. When we're fighting an enemy, when we have an enemy, we usually have some prejudice. What is prejudice? Is ignorance stoked by anger and fear, mostly. That's really what prejudice is. It's, at its core, ignorance. And it's made more powerful by fear and anger. Sometimes it's the ignorance of non-experience. 
I grew up in an area where we didn't have a whole lot of racial tension because there weren't very many people that weren't Norwegians. I, mean, I grew up in Minnesota, so it was, I mean, it was between the Norwegians and the Swedes there might be some tension, but you know, as far as African Americans or Asians or there just wasn't much going on there when I was a kid. I mean, there was one kid in my class that was a white, and he was an adopted Korean kid, you know. And his name was Peterson. Ivor Peterson. <laughs> I don't know what his real name was, but that's what he, we know him as. And, you know, that, that's the place I grew up. And there was a certain kind of ignorance about people because we didn't live near people that were different than us. And so we were easily taken in by stories from other places. Um, I always resisted that, but it, it was there. And there's other people who, it's ignorance because of their experiences. They have a bad experience with somebody who has this particular skin color, or they're from a particular country, or they speak a different language and they couldn't understand them on the phone or something. There was something that happened, and they then project that out on a whole group of people. It's still ignorance. It's ignorance fueled by fear and anger, and sometimes it runs pretty strong. Um, Jonah begrudged the heathen Ninevites, the abundant mercy of God, writes Charles Feinberg. That's the way he viewed them. These are those, those pagan, heathen Ninevites. Why should God show them any mercy? God, I'm angry. I thought I was a special one. And I thought they were our enemies. I thought you felt about them the same way I feel about them. Jonah is the judge. So like so many today, they feel they could govern God's world better than he can. Think of it. The prophet of God, angry beyond measure because of the pardoning grace of God. He was like so many of us, more zealous about the judgment of Nineveh than the sparing of it. He assumed he knew better than God the proper course to be followed. Further under the surface, we see pride. Selfishness. The ultimate expression of it is that he's more worried about the comfort he got from a crazy plant was giving him shade. He was more concerned about that than he was anything else in the whole story, which says something about it, right? Selfish, proud. And how often are the things of God put out before us and we say, oh, I got a better idea. Or God says, you know, you need to do something about this need over here. I say, oh, but my comfort's more important. I've got a plant over here. He's giving me shade. I've got blessings from God. And I want, we, we take the blessings for granted. And we complain if they're taken away. And he says, no, oh, what's really important here? What's on my heart? So further under the surface, pride said, Why, when did he have pity? When did he tear? The word for here for having pity is a word that literally means to tear up. What, what makes God tear up? That's the main point of the story. But what made him tear up? Why did he get all teary-eyed and angry? A stupid plant. A stupid plant. And that's comfort and convenience. You see, he wasn't willing to give up the comfort and the convenience. So, so God decides to give him a lesson in grace under the unpredictable plan. We see it in verses 4 to 6. Let's just run through that real quickly. Jonah left the city, and he sat down east of it. Why would he do that? He's still hoping. He's still hoping. Maybe, 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 even though they've repented, Maybe God will still follow through. Maybe there's going to be there's going to be breaking news. I'm going to bring out my camera, bring out my cell phone. I'm, I'm going to when the, when the firebolt from heaven comes, I'm going to make sure everybody can see. I mean, that's kind of what it seems like is happening here. He's still hoping that God might carry through and 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 just make them toast. And that's still down deep within him. So he makes a shelter for himself, and apparently it didn't work very well, because he was starting to get sunburned a little bit, and he was getting a little irritated and feeling a little dehydrated 
out underneath his shelter out in the middle of the desert there. So the Lord God, and remember this is in Iraq today, right? Right by Mosul, Iraq, you hear about it in the news of that. That's, that's where Nineveh was. Um, the Lord God appointed, I love that, God appointed a little plant, or he sent a little plant. All through this book, he's been sending things. Not always what you want him to send. He sent a storm. He sent a great fish. There's all these things he keeps sending. Well, here, he sent a plant. Sometimes we send plants somebody when they're hospital. Here, God says, you know, you're looking a little sunburned. I'm going to send you a plant. And so he does. He sends him a plant. And the plant grows up, and it causes shade over his head. It rescued him from his misery, it says. And Jonah was, now, here's what we know about, this is what Jonah finds delight in. He says, Jonah was very delighted in the plant. He loved this plant. This, this is a great plant. I'm going to, have you heard about my plant? <laughs> if he had somebody to share it with, he would have loved sharing about that plant, I'm sure. He's very delighted about the plant. So God sent a worm. Here he goes again. God keeps doing things in his life to get him back on track. This time is a part of his illustration. He sends a worm. And so the next day at dawn, it attacks the plant. And the plant dries up. And then God sends a hot east wind and the sun begins to shine. And the sun beats down on Jonah's head. And apparently he was Norwegian too because he started to get sunburned. <laughs> and he despaired of life. And he said, I would rather die than live. I mean, so melodramatic here, isn't he? And then God makes his point. Are you really so angry about this crazy little plant? Okay, I added crazy. And he said, I am as angry as I could possibly be. Isn't that something? I'm just as angry as I could be. I mean, his anger level has been raised to a new level here. I mean, he was, he was mad at what God had done in bringing mercy to the Ninevites. And now he is still hoping that maybe God will still do something about it. And in the meantime, he makes himself a shelter, and then he's got a plant, and now the plant's taken away, and he's getting sunburned again, and the wind's getting hotter, and he's dehydrating and beginning to despair of his life. And then he says, oh, I'm so angry. I, could, I don't think I've ever been this angry in all my life. And then the Lord said, you were upset about this little plant. Something for which you've not worked. You didn't, you didn't, you didn't do anything to make it grow. And it grew up overnight. And it died the next day. You didn't even have time to you know, bond with this plant yet. I mean, it just was there for one day. And now you're angry about this crazy thing. See... It was a God-designed illustration. God appointed a plant. He appointed and sent a worm. He appointed and sent a hot east wind. God will do what he needs to do to make his point. And here it is. The plant, as one commentator writes, the plant is a little gift of grace to turn Jonah from his stubborn course. God shows grace to Jonah. He shows grace to Jonah when he's being disobedient and angry and bad again. It's a symbol here of God's continuing merciful working with the angry prophet. And Jonah, basking in the grace, is very happy. Um, the plant had been solely an undeserved gift from God. And Jonah has had no claim on it whatsoever, yet Jonah has not a shred of pity for the great city of Nineveh. You see, God is bringing out Jonah's selfishness and his sin. His wrong attitudes and his prejudice. And God is setting up an opportunity to share what brings him pity. What makes him tear up. What motivates his actions. And we'll just briefly mention this and we'll develop it more next week. But what is God passionate about? What makes him tear up? What is his pity toward? Toward his creation. And particularly his people. God cares about people. He cares about his whole created order for sure. I mean, we see that he even cares about the cows. I mean, that's the way the book ends. So God cares about animals and cares about things like that. But most importantly, and really the point of the story is, God was right to be merciful and gracious to the Ninevites when they turned to him. That's the kind of God that he is. He's a God who tears up 
over people. People from every place, and especially the places that we might have trouble believing that God can care about them. Those people that we think are other than us. Those people who have different colored skin or speak different languages or live on the other side of the world. God cares about them too. And the point of this whole story from first to last is that God cares about his people. All people around the world. And he wants them to turn to him and in repentance and faith, so that they too can receive mercy and grace. Jonah is the worst missionary on the face of the earth. He, every good thing he does is just backwards. It's wrong. His attitudes are completely the opposite of what they ought to be. But they point to our attitudes, don't they? And they say, oh, we need to deal with our attitudes toward people. And we need to pity the people that God pities. We need to love the people that God loves. We need to even love the people that are hard to love. Because it wasn't easy to love the Ninevites, I guarantee. But yet God did. He had a tear. He had pity over the people of Nineveh. And he has a tear for the people in the high school over on the other side of the mountain. And he's got a tear in his eye. For the people in Kenya that Malu and I had a chance to spend a couple of weeks with. And he has a tear in his eye for those people in Eastern Europe where the Richards are serving. And he has a tear in his eye about the people in, in South America and Central America. He has a tear in his eye about the people in Europe where they have the big cathedrals but nobody shows up. They've forgotten about God. He has a, he has a tear in his eye for people in China and India who don't have a clue about who he is. God has a tear in his eye for this world. He says, you're worried about your personal comfort. You care about this plant more than you care about people. Get your act together. Now, he doesn't say that, interestingly. All the way through this book, God doesn't rebuke Jonah. Which you might expect he would. Why doesn't he just kind of, Jonah, get your act together, you know? Jonah, get your attitude straight. We need an attitude adjustment here. But he doesn't. He just keeps working. He just keeps working, sending things into his life to get his attention and to get him back on track and to make his point. Because the whole thing about a plant and a worm and a wind is about teaching them that grace is more important than justice. That God's heart for all peoples ought to lead us to rejoice when they turn to Him. Well, we're going to stop there for now, I think. Um, there's a few little things that we'll pick up next week as we finish up the book, but <clears throat> learn from Jonah. Not by following his example, <laughs> but by going the other direction. That's one thing you can say about Jonah. Well, let's pray. Father, we just thank you and praise you for this book, which reminds us that you love people. Oh God, you love them with an everlasting love. And uh, you have hesed for people. And even Jesus, on numerous occasions, but especially in John 11, 35, it says Jesus wept. He saw the lost people of Israel who were rejecting him, and he wept. We know, God, that you weep over lost people. Help us to weep over lost people, too. Help us to move beyond our selfishness and our comfort zones and even our prejudices sometimes to love people like you do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well,